There's a lot of debate out there about whether or not you should download ROM files for vintage console games. Well, guess what? I don't have to. I can emulate all day using ROMs that I dumped right from my own cartridges. And I can back up my cartridge's save files before the battery goes bad. And so can you, thanks to this open source hardware tool. Greetings and welcome to another Romerific episode of Veronica Explains. I'm Veronica, and today I'm going to show you a new tool I just picked up, the Open Source Cartridge Reader, or OSCAR for short, from GitHub user Sani and the community they've formed around the project. Now, normally I talk about Linux as well as vintage computers, and this thing here isn't quite either of those things. But who cares? It's my channel and I want to talk about it. This isn't something I was paid to talk about either. It's a neat project that's open source that you can build yourself, or order pre-assembled from any number of vendors on the internet. I have been having lots of fun using this over the last few weeks, and I figured that you might be interested as well. The project consists of a shield for the Arduino Mega, which, according to the project docs, features a modular design, standalone operation, easy to modify source code, and is portable when used together with a power bank. In practical terms, Oscar helps you make copies of the ROM data from your video game cartridges without needing an intermediary computer program or a lot of complex information to get started. Now, this all sounds really neat, and I'll walk you through it in a minute, but since a not insignificant number of you were born before the cartridge game heyday, I'd like to briefly talk about how cartridges work, and if you want to skip this section entirely, here's a timestamp for you. A ROM cartridge is a software delivery mechanism that was popular from the 1970s, the dawn of home computing, until the mid-1990s. We might think of game consoles when we think of cartridges, but early home computers like my Commodore VIC-20 and C64 used cartridges not only for video games, but for general expansion and productivity as well. The software side works by memory mapping, connecting directly to the underlying system hardware via a dedicated bus, instead of being slowly copied from a tape, floppy, or hard disk storage into RAM. Now, to appreciate what this was like, you have to remember that RAM in this time period was exceptionally limited and expensive. My 1982 Commodore 64 has a whopping 64 kilobytes of RAM, but if you think that's limited, my 1980 VIC-20 has a measly 5 kilobytes on board. In this era of constrained resources, directly attaching your program right to the system hardware had a ton of advantages. Here, I'll open up my old Metroid NES cartridge to show you how it all works. There's an edge connector here on the cartridge, not dissimilar to a modern PCIe connection. The edge connector directly connects to these ROM chips, which contain a write-protected version of the system software, in this case, Metroid. When you insert the cartridge into the slot, the edge connector connects those ROM chips, their software, and any additional onboard circuitry directly to the system hardware. In this case, my beat-up old NES, which I'll be cleaning up in a future video. By connecting the software directly to the hardware, as opposed to spending time loading it into system memory, you get the benefits of a nearly instant-on experience. Beyond that decrease in loading time, the other big advantage of cartridge-based software was in enhancements. Lots of cartridges could add additional hardware such as math coprocessors, additional RAM, and even entirely different computer systems. The Super Game Boy comes to mind, as it's basically an entire Game Boy packed into a Super Nintendo cartridge. And here's a CPM cartridge for the Commodore 64, which includes an entire Z80 CPU right there on the cartridge. Imagine if Microsoft shipped you an entire extra processor just to run Excel. Cartridges made that sort of thing possible. In short, these ROM cartridges were often more than just the ROM data themselves, and that was a critical part of computing and gaming back when I was growing up. Another great advantage with ROM cartridges is save states. 
Many cartridges had a battery-backed save function which stored the progress of a game in a static RAM chip, which often used a battery to maintain your save state in between plays. This was a critical step toward longer, more in-depth video games, as you no longer had to leave the system on, monopolizing the Nintendo while you were trying to get through every single level of Mario 3 without your little brother ruining it for you. For all of those advantages, cartridges were expensive and technically challenging to produce. Most computers ditched cartridge ports in favor of floppy disks by the end of the 80s, and video game consoles had mostly switched over to optical media like the compact disc by the end of the 90s. Now, as long as we've had ROM chips, there were tools to copy the data from the chips, also known as dumping the ROM. However, those tools are often clunky to use for anyone other than a seasoned expert in era-appropriate computing. Periodically, commercial products have also come along which can greatly streamline this process. The Retroad comes to mind here, as well as jailbreaking firmware on some dedicated systems like the Analog NT. But those commercial cartridge readers are expensive, rare, and may themselves be prone to failures due to the passage of time. Plus, they're typically closed source, which makes repair and upgrades a bit of a challenge. For enthusiasts going the traditional DIY route, you also have the burden of having to pay attention to how the different ROM chips on a particular cartridge might be laid out. Between character ROM and program ROM and other important bits on the board, it can be pretty confusing to try and do this all by yourself. Plus, because different systems use different voltages and different pinouts, it's relatively easy to accidentally damage or destroy the cartridge that you're trying to preserve. A few mismatched settings and you could end up cooking the ROM chips, and that's no good. But solving that DIY confusion is exactly where the open source cartridge reader is a Viking. Oscar here has a whole lot of sanity checks which do a great job of preventing damage and making this whole process easier than ever. The Oscar runs off of a single micro USB connection for power, and thanks to saving directly to an SD card, does not require lugging a PC around in order to make backups of your games and saves. Fully assembled, the current V5 Oscar contains slots for six classic gaming systems on the top. The NES, Famicom, Super NES, Nintendo 64, Sega Mega Drive, or Genesis as we say here in North America, and the Sega Master System. An additional slot on the back takes your Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games. It's possible to build these with fewer cartridge slots, and there are plenty of variants being sold out there with a more limited selection of options, which might be a good deal for you if you don't need or want all of these systems. A Nintendo 64 controller port on the side is used for backing up N64 controller pack saves, as well as a neat utility for helping to test your joysticks. Joysticks which are frequently failing, a topic I've got some opinions on. Near the N64 controller port, you'll see a power switch and possibly a voltage selector switch, depending on whether or not you've got an automatic voltage selector or V-select add-on. One of the reasons I opted for a pre-built unit was because the V-Select add-on is practically micro-soldering, and I'm just not at that skill level, at least not yet. I'm working on improving those soldering skills, though. Because my board has V-Select, I don't need to flip a switch to change the voltage on my cart reader for 3.3 volt Nintendo 64 games. But for folks with other revisions, you may need to flip that switch prior to turning on the device. Now, mine's a version 5 Oscar, but I've seen others online, like this older Save the Hero version that Linus Tech Tips covered, which have multiple switches for selecting the different cartridges. So your mileage on this project may vary, but personally, I prefer the intuitive controls of the V5 reader paired with the automatic voltage selector. Now, before we begin dumping our own ROMs, here's my obvious legal disclaimer. I am not a lawyer, and I am not going to do you a disservice by telling you that this is a legal way to emulate your games. I mean, I could have put, my ROMs are legal, here's why, in the thumbnail, but I didn't because I'm not a lawyer. Here's what I know. I own these cartridges. I don't dump cartridges for games that I don't own, and I don't share the ROM files on the internet. Don't ask me to do that, either. 
With my non-legal legalese out of the way, let's talk about how to actually use the open source cartridge reader. To start with, you'll need to set up an SD card blanked out and formatted to FAT, FAT32, or XFAT. The project recommends a 32 gigabyte or smaller card, which considering the small size of most cartridge ROMs should be more than enough space. On the GitHub page for the project at github.com slash sani slash cartreader, you'll see releases in the right hand column. Scroll down to the assets for the latest release and you should see an archive ending in portable.zip. Download that file, then extract it to your computer. Inside the extracted archive is a directory called SD card. This contains text files for each supported system, and you'll see that there are many more than the seven slots allow. That's because adapter cards allow Oscar to read many more cartridges, including Atari and Commodore 64 cards. Once I get my hands on some of those adapter cards, I'll be sure to report back with how that goes. If you open one of the text files, you'll see information including the names of games and some assorted data points which the cartridge reader will use to determine the game you're ripping. Copy the entire contents of that SD card folder to the root of your SD card. For some reason, the Windows specific instructions state that you should hide the files. Being a Linux user, I'm skipping that, and I'm not totally sure why they suggest it. If you're with the project, I would love to know more. After formatting the SD card and copying the files, eject the card from your computer and plug it into the Oscar. Then turn it on real quick just to make sure that the SD card isn't reporting any issues. In my case, all looks well, and I can see the different options for copying ROMs by turning the knob. Now, with the unit powered off, you can plug your cartridge into the reader. Now, make sure to only plug one cartridge into the reader at a time. I've seen YouTube thumbnails and ads showing multiple cartridges plugged in at the same time, and that is not correct. You could damage something by doing that. If your Oscar is a version with the voltage selector switch on it, you want to make sure that it's set appropriately based on the specs required by your cartridge. This is another time where reading the docs on the GitHub is a great idea. Since mine has automatic voltage selection, or vselect, I can simply power it up. From here, I'm greeted with a system selection screen. And since my cartridge is a Genesis cartridge, I slide the knob down to Mega Drive slash Genesis, and then press on the knob to select the system. Now, I'm greeted with a device type selector. In my case, this is a game cartridge, so that's what I'll select. After a brief moment, I get some details about the cartridge. In my case, it's Sonic the Hedgehog, so I can simply press the button. From here, I can select several options, but the two that are the most relevant are reading a ROM, the game data itself, or reading the SRAM, the static RAM save file. Sonic doesn't have save data, so we'll skip that for now and hit read ROM. The reader takes a moment to read the relevant chips off the game cartridge board, and then consolidates all of this into a ROM file. From here, you can press the button to exit the screen and then shut off the Oscar. If everything works out, you now have a ROM file saved on your SD card. Now I'll try it again, but this time with Metroid for NES. With Oscar turned off, I'll put the NES cartridge in and then turn it on. This time, I'll select NES slash Famicom, and unlike last time, now it reports a couple of matches, the European Metroid and the US version. Apparently, this is typical with NES or Famicom games, because the headers are not set up the same way they are on other systems. In this case, I have to manually select the US Metroid version, and then I'm given details about the cartridge. Hitting the button brings us to the menu, where I can read the INES ROM. It saves right to the SD card, just like with Sonic. I can then press the button to exit, shut off the Oscar, and then go copy my ROMs to the emulator of my choice. I prefer the Mister. I can simply pop the SD card onto my computer, and then copy my files right over the network to the Mister. Couldn't be easier. 
On Linux, I like using RetroArch, like I installed on my Debian Trixie Chromebook, a topic for a future video. Another great thing about Oscar is the save file backup and restoration. If you've ever lost a save game to a dead button cell battery, you know how tragic that can be. These save games, for me at least, are a direct connection to fun times with my friends and family as a kid. Being able to restore the save games to an emulator, or even after a cartridge restoration, is one of the main reasons why I picked up this cartridge reader. Here's an example. My copy of Donkey Kong for Game Boy had the battery die a couple of weeks ago, which means the save I had been working on is gone. Luckily, I backed it up before it died, thanks to Oscar. To take a backup of a game with a save state, simply insert the game and start Oscar up just like we did when we saved the ROM files. Since this is a Game Boy cartridge, I'll select Game Boy, followed by the Game Boy option here, which is also used for Game Boy Color games. I can see it picked up Donkey Kong right away, so I press the button. For this cartridge, it offers the option to read the ROM, read the save, and write the save. In other cartridge types, you might see this referred to as an SRAM, and as always, the manual on GitHub is your friend. I'll select Read Save, and then Oscar reads the save file, and then saves it to a folder inside the SD card. From here, I can copy the save game into my emulator of choice, or in my case, replace the battery inside the cart. Now that the battery's been replaced, I can restore the old save file to my cartridge. To rewrite the static RAM from an emulated save file or from a backup, simply navigate through like we did before, then select the Write Save or Write SRAM option. You'll be prompted to navigate to the directory corresponding with your save file, and when you select it, after a few moments, my save file is returned to my cartridge. Now I can go back to playing Donkey Kong on my Game Boy, knowing my save is safe once again. And yes, this even lets you take save games from an emulator and put them onto real cartridges. You just have to copy the save file from your emulator to the SD card first. So being that the open source cartridge reader is an open source project, tooling about on the internet, I can see a lot of folks building their own from scratch, which is awesome. As I've mentioned before, I'm working on improving my soldering skills, but I knew I wasn't going to build something this complex right now. And that's okay, because not only am I okay with my limitations as a person, but it looks like there are a few quality vendors selling assembled kits as of the time I'm recording this video. Now, as the printer said in the beginning, this video is not sponsored. I bought this particular unit myself thanks to my generous monthly sustainers. Links are in the description if you'd like to join them for weekly behind-the-scenes updates and other perks. I'll also include a link to the vendor from which I purchased this particular unit, but to be clear, I have no reason to think they do a better or worse job than any of the other vendors out there. That said, I am impressed with the build quality of my Oscar so far, as well as the very nice 3D printed case that it's shipped with. You might remember earlier I said that the project docs say that Oscar can work from a power bank. Well, I tested it on a few of the higher quality power bank sources that I have, and it worked just fine. That said, I imagine you could corrupt save files with a less than ideal battery, so even though the docs state you can use it from a power bank, I personally wouldn't risk it. I treat the Oscar like I treat my old consoles. I don't plug in or unplug the cartridge while the Oscar is powered up. It seems quite possible that doing so could inadvertently bridge some pins in a way that could damage either the cartridge or the reader. Now, admittedly, the documentation is a bit confusing as far as that's concerned, particularly around 3.3 volt cartridges like Nintendo 64 carts. Apparently, Oscar can briefly send 5 volts on startup before the reader boots up. So for now, with N64 cartridges, you might want to plug them in after turning the reader on. I've asked for clarification on the project's GitHub, and if I find out anything more, I'll be sure to pin a comment to this video.
But here's the thing to remember. This is an open source project run by a community, not some big corporate hullabaloo with VC money backing it. You can't expect everything to be perfect, and for what it is, it's pretty great. Finally, I know some of you might be wondering, what's the point of all of this? Yes, I know emulation is here to stay. And many of you have absolutely no interest in acquiring cartridges or original hardware. A cartridge reader like this one might not be for you. I'm not knocking emulation. I have a mister in my living room, and I've enjoyed using emulators since the dawn of the craft. But for me, nothing beats the feeling of plugging in my original controllers, hitting that power switch, and relaxing with the games I grew up with. And it's totally okay if you don't agree with me there. All that aside, even if you never emulate, Oscar has proven indispensable for me as a tool to save and restore my save states, and to ensure that my games remain playable for years to come, regardless of the evolution of the underlying hardware. And this says nothing about all the homebrew opportunities for the Oscar project. Being able to write to some DIY console chips means Oscar is an invaluable tool in homebrew development, something I'd love to explore myself as I learn more about these systems. Commercial cartridge readers have come and gone, but the open source hardware in the Oscar project is a gift that keeps on giving. Even if Sani, whoever they are, decides to step back from this project, because it was developed in the open, nothing would stop a worthy successor, or several of them, from building on and enhancing this idea for years to come. And that's the beauty of open source. For all of the bugs that we're squashing today, we know that we're building something awesome for tomorrow. These cartridges are aging technology. Any advancement in their preservation is a critical part of preserving our history. Doing so with open source hardware ensures that we'll have access to these tools far into the future. So, Sani, whoever you are, thank you. And thanks to saving directly to an SD card, does not require lugging a PC around in order to make copy backups. Call it backups, not copies. I'm getting in trouble.